Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, here we are in Lancaster University and we welcome everyone uh, from our Dyslexia and Language Teaching MOOC who is watching us. And thank you for joining us from all over the world, from Myanmar to Brazil. We've got participants from everywhere. Um, and here I have with me Dr. Anne Margaret Smith and myself, uh, Judith Kormosh. Um, you've met me online and you've met, uh, you've met um, me as well. Yes. Uh, and um, I work here at the university as a professor in second language acquisition. And I have um, written a few books uh, about dyslexia and language learning and a few uh, research publications as well. And, and Margaret will introduce herself. So um, I'm an English language teacher as well as a dyslexia assessor and I run ELT Well, which is a consultancy which aims to bring together these two fields of education. I'm also a senior lecturer in TESOL at the University of Cumbria and I've worked with you on a couple of projects including the DISTEFL project. So that's how we know each other really. Yeah. Um, and let me just start by, by saying thank you, um, because we really enjoyed working with you in the last uh, four weeks. And, and we were delighted to have so many participants and so lively discussions. And we learned a lot from you. And we were very pleased with the positive feedback uh, uh, you gave us. Um, and your questions that you sent for today were also very inspiring and they made us rethink a lot of the issues that we have been working on, we've been thinking about, and they shed new light on some of our own views and beliefs as well. Um, so what is going to be um, today's um, focus? What are we going to talk about today? We looked at your questions and we were trying to group them. But before we go into the questions, I would like to say that I find six things really important when we talk about dyslexia and language teaching. And the first one uh, is positive attitude of the teachers and self-confidence that yes, you can do it and you can teach these students and they will be successful. And as we were reading through your comments and watching your development across the course, we saw that indeed uh, you have developed that self-confidence and self-confidence and that positive attitude. And we were ha very happy to see that. So we're not going to talk about that today. Um, the second thing that we believe is very important is having an up-to-date and accurate knowledge of what learning differences, learning difficulties are, what dyslexia is, because only based on this knowledge can you identify dyslexic students and can you understand their, their problems. And this is something we will briefly talk about today. Um, the next one uh, where we received a lot of questions was recognizing dyslexia, recognizing learning difficulties, which is not easy in multilingual classrooms or in large classrooms. And that's again something we will, we will address um, and we will uh, also give you some other resources in, in written form in the, in the forums. Um, the fourth one is creating inclusive environment. Once you have recognized that a student has difficulty, and even before that, uh, you, you have to create an inclusive environment where everybody can fulfill their potential, potential. And we will, again, take questions on how to create an inclusive environment and what kind of barriers do we see for, for creating an inclusive environment. Um, you also ask questions about the fifth area, which is applying effective intervention techniques. How can you apply them? In what context are they applicable? Uh, how do they work with adult learners? We will um, talk about this today as well. And then finally, uh, it is also important to mention giving a fair assessment to the students. So once we've taught something to the students, then how do we assess what they have learned? And, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it and again point you to, to further resources. So um, let's get started. Let's get started with yeah. the questions. So there were quite a few questions about um, the nature of specific learning differences and um, there was one question specifically about dyslexia and dysgraphia, um, what the similarities and the differences are, and, and about the overlaps generally. So do you want to? Yes. Uh -huh. um, the questions about dysgraphia probably came from continental Europe, where this term is still widely um, used. And dysgraphia is kind of a mixture, an amalgamate of uh, uh, dyspraxia, which is problems with motor coordination, gross motor skills, as well as fine motor skills. That is, students have problems, you know, with handwriting. This is something that you would uh, 
uh, notice illegible handwriting difficulties um, with with written work, but also uh, this what is called dysgraphia in this context. Um, it uh, in, involves dyslexic type difficulties, especially because some languages uh, on the continent are very transparent, such as my own first language, Hungarian. And when you assess or when you observe um, children reading in their first language, they might be fairly accurate and they might even be fast. So maybe you don't notice that, in fact, they have dyslexic difficulties. And also it is based on the misconception that dyslexia only affects reading. So what you see is that they are having problems with spelling in these languages and therefore because they don't have reading problems they are called you know they are kind of labeled having dysgraphia but this label doesn't exist in the uk um, and it doesn't exist in the united states either it is subsumed under dyslexic type difficulties or uh, specific learning differences and overall, you asked about overlaps with other learning difficulties. And we have said it a few times that indeed there are a lot of overlaps with, uh, with other learning difficulties, with uh, um, dyspraxia, which we have just mentioned, um, reading comprehension difficulties that Kate Kane talked about in her video, um, then specific language impairment, which some of you asked about, um, autistic spectrum uh, disorders and attention deficit problems, ADHD, there is a, an overlap. And in fact, dyslexia rarely occurs in isolation, so much so that there are there is even a debate whether we can talk about dyslexia as such, whether it exists as a separate phenomenon. And the reason why you see that dyslexic students vary so much is because of these overlaps. I mean, you get students with different kinds of difficulties and they, they manifest in different ways and they get different, they have different strengths and different weaknesses. And this is why the one size fits all approach wouldn't work with, um, with dyslexic um, students. It's quite complicated. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> And that's why the severity of, 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 uh, of the student's dyslexia or learning difficulty also varies because it depends on the, on the overlap. And there was also a question about whether a particular teaching method um, which was used for all students could actually create specific learning differences or actually create the, the manifestation of dyslexia. Well, I would have to say no um, to this question, kind of categorically no. This is one of the cases when we can kind of easily say yes or no, and there are straightforward answers. Uh, we know what we know currently about dyslexia. It is that it is genetic in origin. It, its origin is in the cognitive processes. And it is true that the social context and the educational context can influence how these learning dif difficulties develop, uh, how they affect the, uh, the students, uh, but, but it doesn't cause uh, a, a learning difficulty or dyslexia. So we have to be very careful between claiming that something causes yeah. something or something influences how it, how it manifests. Mm -hmm. So no. And I suppose linked to that in a way, um, there was a question about medical treatment, whether there is medical treatment for dyslexia. And again, this is, this is a question we included um, in this video. We got this question at the very beginning of the course, but it came back again at the end. And this is something that I really want to stress that dyslexia is not a medical condition. It's an educational issue and an educational question and learning difference and learning difficulty. So because it's not a medical condition, there is no treatment and there is no medicine that would, that would help effectively. I think that's, I think most people agree on that one, don't they? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, um, there was one more question which where you asked um, about the severity um, and the types of dyslexia and let me just go back to that for, for, uh, for, for some uh, words to, to explain. Uh, what we currently know is there are no subtypes of dyslexia. You, you know, we, we already said it's difficult to differentiate dyslexia from other learning difficulties, not to mention dividing dyslexia into subtypes. We, I don't think we can reliably do that. We can talk about different degrees of severity, though, and then it's going to 
when we talk about severity, that's going to have an effect on how we think about accommodations and teaching. Because there are students who only have a mild level of difficulty. And for them, creating an inclusive uh, environment and giving accommodations would be sufficient. Whereas if students have more difficulties or more severe difficulties, then they need what we call focused intervention. And they might just need it for a short period to get them back on track and equip them with relevant strategies. Or if their difficulties are more severe, then they need an ongoing uh, support. And, and we actually think about the degrees of severity in response to what we call intervention and how what kind of, uh, of help or support they need in their education and in their daily life um, as such as well. So that's how we would determine the degree of severity? Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, I think we've come to the end of questions about nature of SPLDs or, or learning difficulties. So I think it's time to move on to your very specific area of expertise, dyslexia assessment, which is something okay. you've been working on for 10 years now, or even more than 10 years? Uh, yes, I've been a dyslexia assessor now for um, about 15 years, and particularly looking at how we can assess multilingual learners Yeah, for the last eight, nine years. Mm. Yeah, so, so what age? We got a question about what age yeah. should we start assessing dyslexia? I think a few people were asking this. Um, it's a tricky one. And of course, what we want to say is the earlier, the better. The sooner we can identify where the specific challenges are for a person, then the sooner we can get the appropriate intervention in place. Um, however, what we know is that young learners, young children, develop at their own rates. And although there are milestones that they're supposed to hit, of course, there's quite a lot of variation. So the general advice is that until a child reaches seven, eight years old, it's very difficult to tell whether the developmental difference is just that. It is just natural variation or whether it is due to a cognitive difference. Um, however, I mean, if, if there are circumstances like um, there's already um, um, other people in the family, perhaps the parents are already manifesting specific learning differences, then we might, we might look earlier. Because as I said, the earlier we can intervene, the better. So if there are circumstances which make us think that, that it's a possibility the child might have SPLD, we might look earlier than seven. But normally I wouldn't want to be assessing children before the age of seven or eight. Yeah, and I don't think formal assessment is possible. No. Even though you as teachers, you might, I mean, I think we can trust teachers so that let's say if they have 10 years of experience, mm -hmm. they would kind of sense what is typical of that age and what is not so typical. But then I think the teachers can actually modify their teaching mm -hmm. practices or they can give extra support even without the formal assessment. That's right. And the formal assessment starts with um, observation and with getting to know the learner. So that's something that teachers can do at any age. Get to know the learner, find out how they approach different tasks and different challenges, um, find out everything they can about the background. And I mean, that's the start of assessment and that can be done anytime, really. Yeah. And something that teachers perhaps ought to be doing yeah. anyway yeah. as general practice. So we had a lot of questions all through, I think, from basically starting from week two, how to tell apart language problems mm. that come, you know, that every language learner has yeah. from learning difficulties. Isn't there a danger that now we're going to label anyone who is kind of a slow language <laughs> learner as having a learning difficulty? Yeah, and it is really, really tricky when you're working with learners who are multilingual um, and maybe you're the language teacher, so you see them in the language learning context, um, it's very, very difficult to know whether the difficulties they're experiencing are um, due to a cognitive difference or it's just part of the learning process, which we all go through as language learners. There's a lot of overlap. Um, however, I, I do think that language learners don't just exist in the language classroom. And the thing to do is to think about whether they're experiencing similar difficulties in other areas of their lives. Um, and the tools that I've put together, which are called Cognitive Assessments for Multilingual Learners, what they do is they try to exclude the language um, element from the assessment so that we're looking at things like speed of processing, not using um, the language that they're learning, but using their own language or using even um, 
non-verbal assessments, speed of processing, um, visual memory, auditory memory, and even phonological awareness and phonological processing. Because these are the things which will show up in other areas of their lives, apart from the language learning. So it is possible to separate them out. Um, it's, it's complicated, <laughs> it's fascinating, um, and it can be done, but we have to be quite careful. Yeah. Yeah, maybe just to add on, on, on that, uh, I mean, in multilingual classrooms, I, I think it's great to have assessment tools like, like yours. Um, how, however, there is also some research when, when students have been in the country for, for a longer time, so when their oral skills are relatively developed, then they can be assessed using the standardized measures, except that the standards will not necessarily apply, so you, the cutoff points may not be exactly the same uh, for them. Yeah, I find that a little bit problematic because we don't know, there hasn't been enough research to find out where the cutoff points then should be. And the problem with using standardized tests is that people want the standard scores. And um, if you do the standard test but just ignore the standard scores, then really why are you doing that? And the nature of those tests is such that they are designed for people who have grown up in a particular language environment and a particular culture. Um, so I think many of the standardized tests are a little bit misleading actually when you use them with multilingual learners from different cultural and linguistic backgrounds. Um, I have found though in my recent research that young learners who are in school in Britain actually can do pretty well on, on some of the oral English tests. Um, but as I say, there's not enough research evidence yet to say where we should move the cutoff yeah, points yeah. to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's it's qualitative and yeah. holistic in nature, and that's fine, but it doesn't give you standard scores. Yeah. Thank you for that. It's really interesting. How about, I mean, one element of uh, assessing um, learning difficulties is assessing students' phonological awareness. Yeah. Uh, we've got a question about how to test phonological awareness. Mm. And that's really tricky. If you don't share the first language with the person um, and your phonological systems have been laid down in a very different way from the person you're assessing, it's quite, it's quite tricky actually to tap into what's happening with their phonological processing. But as part of the, um, the CAMEL suite that I mentioned, the Cognitive Assessments for Multilingual Learners, um, there are some tests that you can do to see how well they are processing um, phonological information in their own language. Uh, and we can look at, for example, um, their phonological discrimination in their own language using their own phonological systems and also with English to see if they at least are aware of differences. Um, and we can look at uh, phonological, um, the manipulation of phonemes, um, how good they are at isolating phonemes in their own language or in English. Um, we just play games, things like spoonerisms are quite good. Um, and especially when you're assessing young learners, it's, it's kind of, it's fun to do that. You play a game and you just observe to see how easily they can isolate phonemes, move them around. Um, so that gives you some insights into it. Uh, it's not standardized, but it's about observing and seeing how easily they do it. Yeah, and this is something that you as teachers um, can do. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've done this in my classroom, actually. I've played this game um, with students in my class and, and they really loved it. And, and so whilst at the same time I was kind of assessing students that I was a little bit concerned about, <laughs> they weren't aware that they were sort of under scrutiny. It was much less threatening and so um, I think you get perhaps some, even a more realistic performance that way. And it also develops their phonological awareness, not only tests it, but... No, that's it. right, and that's right. And there is evidence, of course, that bilingual and multilingual people actually have stronger phonological um, processing because of their uh, increased exposure to a wider range of phonological systems. So. Right, okay, well, I think uh, we have now um, more or less covered um, the nature of SPLDs and dyslexia assessment. Of course, we could have a whole session on dyslexia oh, assessment. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, so let's move over to teaching um, and, uh, and inclusion and, and mm. specific intervention methods. And it's true that in the, in the course we focus more or less on, on younger learners, so we're kind of young learners from the age of six up to nine kind of, or ten primary school or mm -hmm. primary, and then maybe lower secondary school students. Um, although we, we were saying that 
a lot of the, the methods that we suggest are suitable for older students. We, we received quite a lot of questions about adults and adult learners. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, you have more experience with, with adult learners. Um, so we, we got more, uh, we got a question about whether the multisensory approach is appropriate for older learners. And I would say certainly. I mean, I do think that um, the difference between teaching young learners and teaching adults is um, to do with the kinds of activities that you want to do. But the principles of the multisensory learning approach, I think the principles hold right across the age range. Um, uh, but there are ways of implementing it into the, the activities that you do with older learners. Um, we were talking about um, acting out and, and doing role plays and things. And, and I think it's true that some adult learners might feel a little more self-conscious and might not want to um, play sort of the, the sort of games that you might play with younger learners. But certainly role plays are, is, is quite a standard element in, in a lot of adult education classes and you could build in other elements. Um, I think the most important thing about multisensory learning is that you try and hit uh, all the different channels um, and as I say, I mean, there are adult ways of doing that, using visuals and auditory material, as well as having something concrete and tactile to work with. So I think, yeah, definitely it's appropriate. It's more the way it's implemented. Okay, we've got a question about where, what methods to use with adult learners, but I think it's kind of, we've, we've covered that. Yeah, right? I yeah. think, I mean, in the course, we did cover a lot of different mm -hmm. strategies yeah. and techniques. Um, and it's, it, it's really hard for me to, to say what would be the best methods. I think teachers know their students and they know what their students like to do and, and how they respond to different activities. I think that's, that's quite a contextual decision that needs to be made by the teacher. And we we got one question, which um, and, and actually I think quite a few questions on the usefulness of phonological awareness raising for older learners. Mm. Well, because we know how important it is for young children, and you have just mentioned, you know, how you were playing these games with the with the young children in in the classroom. Now, what happens with adult learners whose phonological system is more? Uh, kind of solid or even what I would Let's call maybe fossilized. <laughs> um, so is it useful for, for those older learners? I would say even more, even more important than with young learners because as you say, you know, as, as, as we grow older, our phonological systems become a bit more um, set and less plastic and a bit less flexible. So even more important to help them to notice differences between the phonological system of their own language and the language that they're trying to learn. Um, and I think um, with adults, they have quite a lot of life experience and they probably come across, for example, different accents and different dialects. So they're probably able to draw on experience, which children might not be able to draw on, to think about the differences in, in pronunciation and, and other phonological um, elements. So. Yeah, I think we, we might need to do it in a different way, but it's definitely it's definitely important to do it. Maybe to, to add on to that, we, we know from research that uh, for older learners, um, word reading accuracy is just one of the factors that affects their reading comprehension. Mm -hmm. um, so while with older learn with, with younger learners, we focus a lot on word reading accuracy and phonological awareness. For older learners, we also need to focus on their word reading accuracy because if they misread the words, they will not understand the text. But at, at the same time, I think we should also lay uh, more emphasis on complex text comprehension skills. Um, you know, understanding causation, implicit mm. meaning, references, something that Kate Kane was talking about mm. in her in her video. So that should complement phonological awareness uh, because these older learners have to deal with more complex texts. Yeah. And these are skills that they, they perhaps have developed in their first language. So they, they have the ability to do that. Or if they haven't, then I think even the both languages yes. benefit yes, from this. Right. Okay, um, uh, the next group of questions, um, we received um, some really um, interesting questions about inclusion. Mm -hmm. um, 
And one of the questions uh, was how to create an inclusive environment in large classes. Mm. And related to that, how to make sure that we, if we have a mainstream class with dyslexic and non-dyslexic students, that the non-dyslexic students do not get bored. Yeah, this is a perennial question. Whenever I talk about inclusion, um, people always say, but it won't work in my class because it's too big. And I kind of think, well, I sympathize really because I've also taught very large classes and I know that classroom management then can be tricky, particularly when the students are quite crowded. And But there are still ways that you can make the activities more inclusive and ways that you can manage the class in a more inclusive way. You can put them, you know, large classes, you don't have to teach as a large class, you can put them into smaller groups. They can work together, they can support each other. Um, and differentiation, so maybe you assign slightly different tasks to different students or to different groups. Um, and I think this comes down to, I think what I mentioned before about getting to know the students, and I know this is more difficult when you have a large group, but when you know your students, you're much better able to differentiate and to, to know how to help all of them to learn. Um, and as for non-dyslexic students getting bored, um, this again is where differentiation comes in. If you, if you know that some students are going to work fast and finish quickly, then you need to have sort of classroom routines in place so that they know when they finish what they need to do is perhaps find someone else who's finished, work with them to check, find someone else, you know, find another pair and, and keep checking. Um, or maybe you have some additional material, extension material they can move on to. Um, in my experience, what I found is that actually it's not always the, um, the non-dyslexic students who are waiting and getting bored. Sometimes I've had students with specific learning differences who have finished very fast, maybe because they just did it very, you know, sort of superficially, or um, maybe they were just working really quickly, perhaps not accurately. Yeah. Um, so it's not just the non-dyslexic students who sit around getting bored, I just want to make that point. But for any student who finishes quickly, um, it's useful to have something else, you know, or a routine in place so that they know what the next step would be. Yeah, and if I, I would suggest that if you have any um, influence over how teaching resources are allocated in your school, then for large classes, you can ask for a teaching assistant for the for the language classroom if that's available. If that's possible. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, um, yeah. I mean. Um, I know it's quite a contentious issue whether you ask students to sort of be um, sort of buddies or, or mentors to their classmates. But you know, I think students can get an awful lot from that because often it's it's when you explain something that you actually know it for yourself properly, um, and it, it boosts self-esteem and self-confidence. Um, of course, it can put extra responsibility on the student, so you might want to think about how you rotate that role around the class, but. Yeah, certainly get an extra support if it's available. Yeah, would be great. What things you meant? It, it's great that you mentioned the the support that the peers can give because I think we did receive question how how difficult it is to for for the students who are giving the support mm -hmm. whether we are not requesting too much from the students. Well, I think that's something we have to manage and monitor really as teachers. Yeah, we also had some questions about. Um, when the curriculum is actually dictated by the exam, um, which kind of links to inclusion, I suppose, in a way. Do you want to say something about that? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's again very difficult. I, and I get this question as well, because very often there is a set pace mm. of learning in, during which you have to cover certain material. And the, the pace might be dictated by the curriculum, the pace might be dictated by the um, exam itself, which which is a very difficult case um, when, again, you know, you have to make your voice as teachers heard that, uh, that, that the requirements of the curriculum or the requirements of the exam may not be fair to everyone. Uh, but mm -hmm. again, I know that this is not always um, possi a possibility, in which case I think that's the situation when, when the students would need extra support and that extra support can come with additional classes within the school uh, if that's possible. This is something that I've 
personally been trying to, to lobby for. Um, if students get extra support in their first language, when they learn literacy skills, why don't they get it? Or when they get it in mathematics, then why don't we, they get it when they're learning an additional language? Mm. That would be great if that was possible, but I know I'm being kind of utopistic. So that, yeah, that's, 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 so that's one of the possibilities. I think the other possibility in this case, if the pace is too quick and we know that the dyslexic student may not be able to kind of keep up with the rest of the class, that's the point when we can actually teach the students the, the, the students to be more self-directed mm -hmm. learners and, and to turn to resources that they can use on their own. Mm -hmm. um, and I think now with information technology, I know we got comments that information technology is not every, available everywhere, but in many parts of the world it's available and there are excellent resources for for practicing on, on your own. Mm -hmm. And if but then even the teacher needs to invest the time yeah. into that because we can't really expect that in this digital age the children know how to use computers they use it for playing games but they may not know all the resources that it, that are out there to help their learning mm -hmm. um, and we we provided you with a list of ICT resources uh, yeah. in the extra resource list and you suggested a lot of resources yeah, so I suggested a lot yeah. it's really impressive yeah so <laughs> we have it we have it on the padlet wall in unit four and we've got it in the extra resources section in unit two mm -hmm. but again i think it is really worth um for the teacher to spend that extra time and mm -hmm. teach the student how to use that and and create maybe shared ict resources like with quizlet it's possible that students actually compete with each other right. online and 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 share the resources that they have created for themselves but i think there's a, a systemic um, issue here as well about expectations, the expectation that everybody will work at the same pace, will pass the exam at the same time. And I think, you know, we have to be realistic and we have to um, try and help students to be realistic about what their um, attainment will be within a certain time frame. I'm not saying that we should discourage students from thinking that they can succeed, but we need to be realistic about how much time they might need um, because with the best will in the world and all the additional resources, learning a language takes time to assimilate all the information and for some learners it will take longer than others. So when the exam dictates the curriculum, that's really, really hard and I think really if we need to step back and look at the big picture and think where does this come from, this expectation that everyone will take the exam at the same time. I know there's a lot of different stakeholders involved there yeah. and yeah. not easy to yeah, and to reconcile yeah. and it varies in different parts of the world as well yeah. how how important exams are indeed yeah right so uh, i think so far we talked about inclusion mm -hmm. uh, mostly now we're going to uh think a little bit about intervention and yeah. specific intervention methods well we started talking a little bit about this already haven't we but the, there was a question about um, how we can integrate the multisensory approach into communicative language teaching. I think some people were seeing a bit of a, a tension between the communicative approach to teaching and using uh, a much more sort of explicit multisensory approach. Do you want to say something about yes, that? Yes, and, and I really, that, that was the question that, that I, I really uh, found interesting mm -hmm. because that you know, made me reconsider um, um, a lot of issues uh, within, within language teaching and 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 think over some of some of the uh, um, the best well, if there is any some some of the effective techniques for, for for teaching, and and some of you have actually provided some answers to these questions, and and those answers were actually very good. Um, so we know communicative language teaching was the big thing in the at the end of the twentieth century, maybe early twenty first a century. And we know from, from research in, in the field of second language learning that it is important to, to use authentic materials to, to, to give meaningful tasks to students when they work with the language, to give them authentic reading, um, listening materials to make them speak in the classroom, use the language, work with the language and not only learn about the language. Um, 
but um, the kind of the pendulum has sw swung to the extreme. Mm -hmm. So with the communicative language teaching, and it was assumed that if we do all this and expose students to loads of communicative input, and then if we ask them to engage and use the language, then they they will speak accurately and they will speak using the appropriate words in the appropriate context. They will write, produce appropriate text in written form. They will learn the spelling of, of words and so on. Now, I think anyone who has worked in an um, in instructed setting, so not, not necessarily in immersion context, maybe that's true in, in some immersion context, but a lot of exposure. Yeah, language. yeah. So let's say when the child arrives in the target language country at the age of five and spends nine hours in the language environment in school and watching TV at home playing games and the child is young, Yes, um, definitely. Um, they will kind of pick up the language without too much um, explicit teaching. Although I, I um, in, even in the UK we have EAL uh, tutors coming to schools and helping the students. Um, but uh, we know that in the classroom the time is limited. The students spend maybe three, four hours a week in a classroom. And there is a limited amount of input that they would get and there is a limited amount of that time they were using the language. And uh, certain regularities of the language are just not salient. They are not necessarily noticeable. For example, the third person S. You, it's so hidden and it means so many different things that you don't um, notice it. And then some of the things the students might actually notice, such as, for example, different ways of spelling words, but the, the regularities are so complex or there are so many exceptions yeah. that they it's just too much to, to cope with. And this is when we need some explicit teaching and we need more explicit teaching when the students have learning difficulties because they find it difficult to 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 induce all these rules and regularities from the inputs uh, from the input um, themselves sorry what i found is that often dyslexic learners or learners with specific learning differences um, are just seeing different patterns yeah. So the the rules that they come up it's, with are it's, it's quite different from yeah. the ones I'm using. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. So they that's that's the other option. They don't notice. They they um, then they if they notice they they come up with different expectation or different explanations mm -hmm. for uh, for for the regularities of language. And by regularities of the language, I mean many things: grammar, spelling, um, how we use certain words in certain situations. So there are many, many regularities of language. I'm not talking about rules. Mind you, notice that, that I'm even using a different word here. So, but nonetheless, we don't want to say that we should go back to the presentation practice pattern and we should go back to grammar translation mm -hmm. method. There are many other ways to uh, enhance explicit learning or help students in this discovery process. And I would rather like to think about this as a discovery process, a guided discovery, guided discovery um, yeah. process. Yeah. Um, and we can do several things. Um, we can do it kind of what we call proactively, so that we create a context in which the students notice things. So we, we make, make things kind of more salient, more visible, more you know, perceivable for, for the students. We direct their attention to these things, and then we help them discover. And if they can't discover, then we give them clues, like the little detective clues, mm -hmm. and then hopefully they will find the, the mur murderer mm -hmm. or, or the regularity. If not, then we, we, we tell them explicitly what is the regularity. And it doesn't mean that we're going to give kind of really detailed description of rules with the, with the words like noun, verb, adjectives, and different complements, what, what not. Uh, we will try to use their own words and their own concepts to, to make those um, regularities understandable for them and, and kind of verbalizable for themselves. And we don't want we don't want them to memorize those rules. Mm -hmm. We just don't want them to understand mm -hmm. and then maybe I'll, I'll apply afterwards. Another possibility is to is to kind of do it reactively, uh, and the students are using some of the some of the language, and then maybe they are not using it correctly. And that's when we give feedback and we give explicit feedback and we give feedback in a way that that they can pay attention to the feedback so it's not necessarily always in spontaneous interaction 
because then that would kind of interrupt the interaction. But little post-it notes or recording the interaction and, and pointing it out and explaining it to them explicitly what was, uh, what was incorrect or inaccurate and then making them practice it mm. in other contexts. Mm. So that's, that's a kind of guided discovery process that I would, I would suggest, not necessarily the kind of old fashioned explicit teaching. And I do believe that, that explicit knowledge and explicit awareness plays an important role in, in learning a language. Absolutely, and I think Margaret Crombie was talking about metacognitive strategies and, and um, when students become aware of how the process works for themselves and, and within the language, that's when they become more successful language learners. So yeah, awareness, I think, is it's really important. Yeah, and, and what is also important, especially for, for dyslexic students, but for other students as well, is some kind of practice, um, not necessarily the monotonous drilling mm. practice, but some kind of controlled practice when they can just work on that specific bit of language in isolation because we know that when we speak a language like I'm speaking now I have to pay attention to so many things <laughs> so many uh, things have to be coordinated in my mind that if I want to practice a particular construction I need to isolate some of the features at least for a little while mm, and then of yeah. course you know you can use it again in communication but I think it's it's important to give uh, practice opportunities for for students um, and this is where also the multi-sensor ways of enhancing the input come in, visual, kind of uh, even now we can make things manipulate, in the, in, you know, with the auditory features or, or, or video features, multi-sensory ways of demonstrating regularities in the language with the cuisinaire roles yeah. and with the videos that um, uh, you saw some of our mentors um, showing you different techniques, multi-sensory ways of helping memorizing some of the things. Um, and, and also multi-sensory ways of, of practicing uh, yeah. that makes practice more creative and yeah, more, yeah. more enjoyable. So that would be my answer um, to communicative language teaching and, and the multi-sensory learning it approach. Was comprehensive. Yeah. <laughs> and we got, we got a question related to this is um, any course books, do we recommend any course books suitable for dyslexic students? Well. I don't think we can really recommend any particular course book, can we? Um, the, most of the course books that I've worked with, I have to say, I, I find them um, quite busy and even students who don't have specific learning differences can get lost in the, the text and the pictures and the, the exercises here and there. And um, I, I know a lot of publishers are becoming more aware of SBLDs and, and trying to be a bit more inclusive in the way that they present the material. Um, we had that one example, didn't we, uh, in the course, but that was sort of tips for teachers. The actual um, structure of the course book uh, hasn't changed that much, I don't think. Um, but uh, I, if, if I may just say <laughs> that I have had a go myself at writing a course book. We're writing um, for the Greek market, actually, the EFL market young learners who are dyslexic and learning English and the book's called English Sounds Fun. And what we've tried to do is to incorporate all these things that we've talked about, multi-sensory learning, um, giving them lots of opportunities for repetition, um, really paying attention to small bits of language at a time, and then towards the end of the lesson, pulling it all together and giving them opportunities to use the new language in, con in conjunction with what they already know, so building it up very systematically. Um, and I'm hoping that that course book will be very helpful for dyslexic learners. Uh, it should be out next month. It should be ready next month. Oh, we're really. looking forward, forward so, to yeah. and it. And it comes with a lot of really fun things like um, wiki sticks that the, so the students can actually make the letters so they really feel the form of the letter um, and little mini boards so that they can focus on, on writing um, and forming a sentence. So. In a lot of cases, when we're practicing sentence structure, we're having to write and think about the structure. But when we have individual words, we can think about the spelling first, and then when we've got the words, we can play with the sentence structure and um, and discover what happens when you move words around. And so, yeah, it's, it is fun actually. So, 
I hope people will enjoy that. Yeah, so English sounds fun. <laughs> yes, <laughs> sounds fun. Yeah, great title too. Okay, well, um, I think we have to move on to another topic. And this is the, the issue of disclosure and awareness. Mm. And mm -hmm. we are now moving into a topic, I think so far we could more or less give you quite straightforward answers. And we were also kind of more confident in the answers that we were giving. Now, what you will hear really is kind of our conversation about some of your difficult questions. Very complex <laughs> issues. Yes. Really. Um, so let me just read out one question that one of you sent out. And the question sounds like this. Do we as teachers of mixed ability classes, some of whom may be learners with SVLD, help them feel part of the class and not draw attention to their particular difficulties or treat them as special students? What do you suggest? Yeah, this is a really big question, isn't it? Um, where do we start with this? The thing is that, to me, ideally, an inclusive classroom um, everybody acknowledges that everybody has strengths and differences and there shouldn't be any shame, there shouldn't be any stigma in somebody saying, oh, I find that difficult because I have dyslexia or because my memory isn't so good or, you know, that shouldn't be a problem. Um, but unfortunately, the reality is that there's still quite a lot of stigma attached to, to being different. And I think particularly in different age groups, I think teenagers often like to be the same um, as their classmates, so it's harder for them, I think, to to be different and to um, to show that they're different. It also depends, I think, um, culturally a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And what maybe my advice would be: you see, in our task, when you had to write with your with the hand you normally don't write with, and you had to. Uh, follow different steps of instruction, a lot, of, place, processing. lot yeah. of processing, and and I think that was an eye opener for many of you. Really, and we got a lot of feedback on on that task, and you, yeah. I think that that task really drives drives it home, what it means to have a learning difference, and I think because that task is actually freely freely available, um, you can tr try and use that task, or you can create your own. Yeah. Um, a similar one and do it with the class because I think when you get a group of students it's also uh, you know you you try to form a community um, for establish group cohesion because you will be working together probably for a, yeah. for a longer period and I think that can be part of it that you show what it feels like to have a learning uh, difference mm. or you can show you know we had one of the cartoons when we we said you know to be fair to everyone we give you the same task oh, climb, cartoons, cl it? climb that mountain and then we've got an owl um, a fish. fish and and I don't know yeah. um, birds and so on so I think these and then have a discussion around that even in the students first language uh, what Absolutely, it means to yeah. be different, what it means to have um, have, um, have have strength and, and and weaknesses, and I think if you manage to establish this kind of understanding within the classroom, then then being a different or having an SPLE is not going to be shameful, and it's going to result in 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 other students wanting to help, and also discussing how you can help. Little yeah, things you, like taking notes for somebody yeah. else. But also what the student with SPLD can contribute. Um, and I think, I mean, the, it is quite a big job in some contexts, it's quite a big job to take on. But I do think that the, um, the awareness raising activities that you can do can be not just within the class, but I mean, amongst your colleagues perhaps. Um, because it, it, if it spreads beyond your classroom to the whole school, then there's much more chance that other students will also come forward and say, do you know, I think maybe I don't learn that way either, you know, mm -hmm. and so it becomes much more acceptable on a, you know, a wider um, community. Um, and from that, of course, the student starts to develop self-awareness too. And that, I think, is one of the most important things that, well, any student can develop, but students with specific learning differences really need to develop self-awareness about how they learn best, what things they find challenging, how to get over those barriers that they that they come up against so yeah self-awareness um, peer awareness and um, teacher awareness I think these all go together yeah and I think something that was related to that but I won't jump ahead is parent awareness oh. yes. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. yeah. So because again, parents awareness is going to come uh, play a role, but yeah. we'll, we'll come back to that in a, in a in a minute. Um, yes, I mean chipping on in, into self awareness. I think it's it's again very important. Mm. It's important for those who are already successful. Um, yes coping with their difficulties um, to make them aware of what works for them and and also maybe what doesn't work mm -hmm. for them but it's it's also very important for those who are struggling because they are maybe they are not using the right strategies yeah. Um, yeah. to to cope and, and and i think when you have a community like you were describing a, a group that works together maybe somebody says oh what i do is this and and then another student thinks i might try that and maybe it works for them um, you know, so sharing strategies like that can be really, really valuable. And students who don't have specific learning differences can benefit from that as yeah, well. Absolutely. And they be, yeah, absolutely. They become even more effective learners um, by trying out different things that they've seen their classmates doing. Um, and I think that the key thing, though, is um, not to treat people as, as special and sort of patronize them and say, well, well, you know, never mind, you don't have to do that but to say, okay, well, you know, we all find some things difficult. How are we going to tackle this? How are we going to get around it? Um, because otherwise students can learn this kind of helplessness mm -hmm. and that later on when they come to university and I'm working with them, <laughs> that's really, really hard. Then by the time they become adults to persuade them that actually they can work independently and they in fact need to work independently. So I think, um, what you were saying about fostering a community of of um, support, but without only you know just supporting one student, I think it's got to be mutual support. Yeah, and and then related to that, we've got a, a question: How do you, as teachers, help your students find the strategies that tend to work best for them? And yeah. and we've already kind of addressed them um, this question when we uh, were discussing what we can do in the classroom. Think we can have spend individual time on this, with the student, finding out how they learn best. Or, or my example, something I usually started teaching with when I got a new group was giving them ten new words to learn in the classroom, and uh, giving them five minutes mm. to learn those words, and then getting together and, and see how did you learn those words? What kind of strategies did you use? So sharing mm -hmm. those strategies and then looking. At, and actually how that strategy led to success or didn't lead to success. And in this respect, I think language learning is very good because it does involve some kind of memorization, whether we want it or not, because you have to memorize some mm. words. Uh, it wouldn't work without memorization. Okay. And there are also so many skills. Language learning is skills-based and a lot of skills are transferable outside yeah. um, the language domain. Um, so I think these kind of strategies that you do, how do you revise for a test mm -hmm. again you know you maybe you sacrifice 40 minutes of your class time for that but it has so much, much return and I think one of the skills that they are developing through doing that is is reflection and that is something that they can use not just in language learning not just in learning but actually throughout the whole lives reflecting on what they've done reflecting on how it went what could have been better and when they get to university certainly in Britain and I think um, across Europe and America as well Reflection is something that university students are more and more being required to do. So let's start early and, and feeding into the self-awareness. Yeah, and then also related to reflection is also kind of assessing how much I, how well I know it. Yeah. Kind of self-assessing what, what I have already learned and what is it that I need to do. I think I find that with my own children, mm -hmm. that's something they, they come and say, oh, I've learned this. But in fact, you know, they haven't. And then I ask them to self-assess. So how far did you get and what else do you need to do? Yeah, yeah. And that's a really important skill for them to have, yeah. all students to have. Yeah. So it's worth investing the time, I think. Okay. And then we had the question about disclosure and, and parents. So how do we uh, impart information um, to, to parents if we think their children have learning difficulties? And how do we involve um, them in collaborating with us? These are big questions again, aren't they? And context dependent, culture, culture dependent. Um, comes back to a point I made about knowing your students and knowing the parents. And that's that's not easy. If you've got a big class and you don't have much contact with the parents, it can be hard to know the best way to, to broach the subject. Um, obviously, it needs to be done. Parents really need to be kept informed. 
and informed about how best they can support their children, um, perhaps asking them to do quite specific tasks with the children uh, or the young people. <laughs> um, helping them develop self-awareness as well and helping them to develop organisation skills, um, you know, all sorts of things that can be done at home to complement what's done at school. Yeah, so I mean, is, there are no easy answers for this. No, there you know? really aren't. Yeah, I mean, some of some things that help is, you know, kind of generic workshop inviting every parent for to a workshop on learning difficulties in school, um, post posters about learning difficulties where you know parents frequently um, turn up in school and they look at the poster and they might think, well, maybe my child has learning mm. difficulty, um, and then one to one conferences mm. with the with the parents. But, but again, there are not easy answers, especially mm. if the society is not very accepting of I think this is it. I think in Britain, there are, there are many more um, avenues in which we can talk about diversity generally and specific learning differences as part of that. And parents get involved in, in all sorts of activities that children are doing at school. But I know that in other countries, you know, it's, it's a very different education system and um, there perhaps aren't those opportunities for those kinds of discussions to be had. So, now, I mean, we suggested, um, we found very useful information on the Irish Dyslexia Association mm -hmm. website about how to work with parents and engage the parents, and we, we put it in writing in one of the forums. But if you just Google Irish Dyslexia Association or your local Dyslexia Association, I think local dyslexia they association often have yeah. information for parents. Yeah, they're usually yeah. set up for working with families as well and providing um, quite concrete ideas and support of, of what can be done. Yeah. Right. So we're coming to the last yeah. question now. We have time, just about. Yeah. To talk very briefly perhaps yeah. about yeah. testing. Um, once we've taught our students successfully, we often need to assess how much they've learned. And of course, for students who have specific learning differences, that test can be an additional barrier. Um, you know, after all the learning has been done, that test is like another challenge for them. So one of the questions we had was, should we encourage students to take standardised exams, um, considering that the, the uh, accommodation that's available to them isn't always very extensive? Yeah, I mean, sometimes there's just no question they have to, they have to do it for university entrance, for graduation, mm -hmm. for, for, um, for exam purposes. Um, so then they have to. Um, if they have to, then what is very important, because there are some accommodations, mm -hmm. is to find out what these are, how to apply for them, and then practice using those accommodations. So that, for example, if they get extended time, they don't spend the extended time worrying about what to do, yeah. but they use it, use that time meaningfully. Yeah. Or if they have a screen reader, they know how to process oral information, and they, they know that it's helpful for them, because it may not be helpful for everyone. So that, that would be my advice. Otherwise, if you're just sending a student for an exam because you want to motivate the student to progress further with the language, I, I wouldn't recommend it for anyone, um, but not for students with specific learning differences. Mm -hmm. And then you, you um, I think we have to wrap up quite quickly. Um, when it comes to non-standardized exams in your classroom test, I would suggest that you apply what you learned uh, about inclusive teaching mm -hmm. in designing your, your tests. That's right. Yeah. Um, you know, think about your expectations, the aim of the test, the task format, how much time you give, under what circumstances you administer the test, how you score it, and how, what kind of feedback you give. Feedback put. is all in yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, so that you, you praise the students for whatever they have achieved, and you point out where they need to develop rather than what they have done wrong, yeah. um, because it can do a lot of harm to their self-esteem. Um, but if you're more interested in, in, in testing assessment in more detail, the Distaffel website has, an, has a complete unit, and there is a 10-minute lecture that I prepared on assessment that is available. So, and there's a chapter in our book. Yeah, and there is a chapter in our book too on assessment, so you're very welcome to read that. Now, it was really, um, I think, very interesting to discuss these questions, and thank you really very interesting much. interesting questions, yeah, yeah. And, and so wide-ranging. I've covered so many different issues, we couldn't possibly cover everything today in this one hour, unfortunately. But it's uh, certainly been 
uh, fascinating experience being part of this MOOC. Yes, I, I enjoyed it. I, I, I can honestly say it's been one of the highlights of my teaching career. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you, everyone. And thank you, Anne Margaret, for, for joining me today. Yeah, um, and um, just I, I would say don't leave, stay <laughs> with us. Um, um, there, there are many ways to, to keep in touch. Um, you can like the Facebook of the Distaffel project and keep uh, in touch as a community. You can visit the Distaffel website. Um, the materials on Future Learn will be available for you for future use. We're having a webinar. Joanna Niakowska, who was our lead mentor uh, this week, and myself will give a British Council webinar on the 28th of um, May on Thursday. Information again posted in the final letter that you will receive. Um, please visit ELT Wells uh, website. ELT Wells. Uh, yes. Um, and follow uh, me and our department on, on Twitter. We'll keep you updated and read the final course email because it will have all this information in a written channel as well. So thank you very much, everyone, and goodbye. Have a nice have evening, a, a nice, you yeah, have a good weekend, um, a nice day that is ahead of you, depending on where you are. You are. Yeah. Yes. <laughs>